when we talk about mobility, we tend to, in some sense, think of it as the correlation of parents and kids. Well, that, that was a terrible cor lack of correlation. In other words, there was something about the nature of discrimination in America at that point in time, and I think the data around the late 50s was taken from, that many parents could not lock their kids in. And so I think that what we need is, and of course, I don't, this is not an original thought to say that the world has nonlinearities. I think we need way, ways to distinguish the, the characterization of inequalities and persistence intergenerationally between individuals and the morally salient and historically salient social groupings we face. I'm Stephen Durloff. I'm a professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and I'm also the director of the Stone Center for Research on Wealth Inequality and Mobility. The name of the Great Gatsby Curve in some ways reflects the fact that the, uh, the idea was, was politically salient. And what I mean by that is that uh, a number of economists, and I think Miles Korak uh, deserves particular credit, identified that if you look across countries, those countries that had relatively uh, tight distributions of income cross-sectionally tended to be more socially intergenerationally mobile than others. And so, in other words, it looked like that those countries that were both unequal at one point in time were unequal, more unequal in terms of the extent to which parents could control the parental income, control the destiny of children. Uh, when next this came out, the then cha uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Alan Kruger, dubbed it the Great Gatsby Curve. And I think the reason that it had political salience is that it was one, it really did challenge certain uh, American my myths. And so a thing that was said when I was an undergraduate, for example, was that America had made a different choice from Europe in terms of the social welfare programs. The idea would be that Americans care about equality, want opportunity. And so in a society where you want to maximize opportunities, you, by corollary, allow for lots of inequality in the outcomes. Well, in some sense, what the curve was saying was there isn't a trade-off. In other words, societies could both have very high levels of mobility and not particularly disparate levels of, uh, comparatively lower levels of, uh, of cross-sectional inequality of outcomes. And so in that sense, I think it resonated, not just because it challenged a myth, but because of all conventional measures. Inequality has been going up the last 40 years. Now, the reasons for it, the levels of the changes, all of that is under debate, but the fact of increasing inequality, I don't think is per se disputed. And so that intersection did it. Now, then you could ask a second question, which is, what does this mean normatively? And I think the idea of the Great Gatsby Curve uh, has salience because it tells us that there's a consequence to cross-sectional inequality that is particularly uh, uh, morally disturbing. And what I mean by that is that in theories of distributive justice, what are fair distributions, you know, what makes inequality fair or unfair, one of the primary ideas is that inequality is unfair if it is for, for reasons that a person should not be held responsible for. And that idea I, should be associated with the economist and philosopher uh, John Romer. And so if one you know, reflects upon that, a society in which the inequalities we observe cross-sectionally are to a large extent driven by differences in parental uh, characteristics, it's extremely hard to defend that. Because as they say, the, the lottery is one <laughs> with reference to parents and kids. You don't get to choose them. And so that becomes a fundamental argument that, uh, that there's ethical argument in terms of the justifications for policies to reduce inequality. Is what sort of uh, mechanisms generate a relationship between persistence across generations and cross-sectional inequality. Now, one has to be a little bit careful about that in the sense that there may just be mathematical relationships between them. This may sound boring, but it's <laughs> The underlying vision of the data in an economy is there's this, this, this process that's evolving and it has many features. Some features are cross-sectional, some are, some are, are dynamic or inter intergenerational. And so the first question you ask is, this is the nerdy stuff, you have to ask is to what extent is it a mechanism versus a function of the, uh, the fact that there's a, what's, uh, there's a process that's evolving. So let me put that there. And the reason I say it that way is that one could ask the question, if I see a, cor a positive correlation between persistence and inequality, well, you, you know the banality, <laughs> correlation is not causation, how do we think about the relationships between them? Most of the theories have embedded in them the implication that inequality begets persistence. And it turns out that the, t the, the, the canonical mathematical models <laughs> which can generate it mechanically, it's persistence begets inequality, so that you could edit all that out as being boring, but that's kind of the, the background to it. I think the theories of the Gatsby Curve come in, in, uh, in, in, in three broad categories. 
One of them are ones that are based on family influences. And so one idea would be that family incomes matter directly for children. There's investments by the parents. A more complex version of such a model would say that family characteristics are both the family's income and the educational levels of the parents. And so what that would do is it would say that there's a direct income effect from parent to child and an indirect effect because education, of course, affects the parent's, the parents' income. From that vantage point, what happens intuitively is that as incomes spread out, you have greater disparities in the investments in children and uh, from their parents and the influences the parents interact with that because there would be an implicit idea that, that highly educated parents are probably pretty good at spending money to educate their kids and get them to succeed. And so more inequality amongst the parents' education and income levels generates greater persistence when you look at the offspring of the rich and the poor families. So that would be one very broad way to think about it. A second category, I'm going to call that social, and this is the area that I personally worked on as, a, as, an, as, a, as an economic theorist. And there the idea is to think, say that many of the mechanisms that, that matter for uh, the success of children, are, are they're socially determined. And so to make that concrete, one thinks about neighborhoods and schools. Now, parental income matters for neighborhoods and schools, but it's, it's a different way to think about it. What parental income does is it determines what sort of neighborhoods and what sort of schools a child grows up in. From that vantage point, as parental income becomes more unequal, the quality of schools, the quality, the characteristics of neighborhoods become more dispersed, and that is what allows the inequalities amongst the parents to, uh, to be perpetuated across time. Now, in that vantage point, there's really kind of, you know, there's several reasons why this would matter. The, uh, you know, one obvious one is the way the United States finances education. There's, in many cases, very large differences in per capita expenditures de depending on the affluence of the neighborhood. So the political economy does that. The other is simply that segregation more broadly generates intergenerational disparities. There's, you know, uh, if you, you know, you look at things such as exposure to lead, exposure to violence, the list goes on. Fluid parents can isolate their children from these, in, th these phenomena in ways that, let, that poor families, less affluent families, cannot. And the evidence of the effects of those two, for example, is incontrovertible on, on future success. And so I would say that the difference between the social and the, uh, the family ones, by definition, is that the family ones say, you know, you sort of change resources in a certain way for the family, or you augment the family resources. You know, uh, through uh, early childhood investment might be an example, whereas the social ones really focus on segregation. In other words, even reducing socioeconomic segregation or reducing its consequences. So if I were to equalize expenditures across neighborhoods, I'm sounding like a real social planner, uh, that would make the consequence of living in neighborhoods with different incomes less. The other, of course, is to make affirmative st uh, actions to increase integration of communities. Now, I put those there uh, as a good economist. I, of course, mentioned the two, uh, the body of economics work. There's work by economists and political scientists that we were in political economy, which would ask about how inequality begets persistence. And so the sort of idea there would be that as if you have more unequal uh, distribution of income, the policies that emerge from that system become less generous towards the disadvantage. And so you have a cycle in which inequality leads to a less generous uh, so either social welfare state or efforts to improve the quality of poor schools, et cetera, and that would, so that would generate the dynamic. But most of what I've had to say is thinking about a Gatsby curve within a country. You take the United States and you ask intertemporally when inequality is greater in this generation will you have more persistence of status. A different question is comparing the United States to Scandinavia, for example, which is what the, the, the original Gatsby curve did. I think that what I would emphasize in thinking about the socioeconomic mechanisms in the Gatsby curve is this is a canonical example of the importance for, of multidisciplinary perspectives. If you think about the explanations that I gave you, I started with a very neoclassical economics idea. Parents invest in their children. The budget constraints determined by the parents' investment, and so that's what generated persistence. Then I switched a little bit. I said, well, that's, you know, that's 20th, you know, 21st century. You say it's not just the uh, parents' income, it's characteristics of the parents. That would be the skills idea. I then said well, something about social. 
that's really a sociological idea. <laughs> in, in other words, if I say to you that there are phenomena in terms of the relationship between the milieu in which people grow up and how, what happens to them, that's where economics and sociology naturally meld. When I was making arguments about the relationship between the distribution of income and associated political outcomes, and of course I could have decomposed that to say there's differences in political power if you have you know, certain disparities in income, so on and so forth, to explain why there is, that's where political science integrates with economics. So I think the most important thing I'd put on the table is that if I took what were the canonical explanations, those represent a, a, a real need for the integration of political science, economics, and, and sociology. Now, in saying that, I didn't mean to give short shrift to psychology because, <laughs> and in fact, in the, you know, my own you know, synthesis of the literature, uh, I've emphasized and I, with my co-authors, Jimmy Tan and Andros Cortellos, that there's also ideas of identity that have to do with the psychology of individuals, societies that are segregated. There's another set of consequences. How do people think about themselves? And so an example I would give is that, um, um, you know, we also we talk about college as the gateway to success, which, you know, is an empirical matter. I, I'm happy to agree with that. If one grows up in a community in which nobody has gone to, uh, to college, your parents haven't, it's not just a matter of saying they don't have role models. It's saying that you're requiring an active imagination that isn't necessary for somebody. And let's say, you know, the joke I always tell my students is, did my children have a chance to go to college? The answer is, well, I guess it was a choice. But their parent was a college professor. All the parents' friends were college professors. All of their friends were the kids of college. <laughs> they, in other words, that's not just a matter of, as I said, as a role model. It's a matter of something else, which is the acts of imagination, the capacity to see oneself in a different world than the one one starts in. Uh, there's been some very interesting work, for example, on so-called low, uh, low-cost interventions in, in improving college education. And one of them is in cases of, of students of color or, and students uh, in which the, in freshman orientation, you take steps to f positively facilitate how they're going to process the college experience. And so what do I mean by that? There is an irreducible fact at every college, and that is people went to high schools of different quality. If you went to a lousy high school, it's likely your freshman year is going to be pretty tough. If you're 17 or 18 years old and you show up in college and you get a poor grade the first time, how do you process that information? Do you say, I've got to just, I'm going to need to bear down, I've got to be patient with the fact people came from different backgrounds, or do you engage in, in self-questioning? To me, that's in, those are issues of identity. Those are the issues of the psychology of feeling that this college, this institution, later on in the labor force, this organization, that's a place where I fit. So I see very important areas of psychology which speak to the Gatsby curve, but I want to be honest, there's only, only a little bit work's been done on that, and it's none of it as far as I know by economists. I think that in terms of general research and intergenerational mobility, there's a great need to think uh, more in a richer fashion about the process that transmits things about parents to, to children. I mean, that, the mobility is, def is definitionally about parents and kids. So here's one example. I'll tell you things I'm working on, and so in that sense, it's self-serving, but I, I hope it's important. And so one question would be, should we think about parents as having this, this, this single measure of income when a child's growing up? Economists call it permanent income. It's operational. You take the average of the incomes from, let's say, age 0 to 19. A different thing to say is that incomes at different ages matter. So maybe the influence of income when you're born is different than the income your parent has when, they're, when you're 16 years old. And so a number of people have studied that. And, and so the particular work that I'm doing, and I, I, I want to mention my co-authors at Yusung Chang and June Park at, at University of Indiana Bloomington and Sung Hee Lee, who is now at the Korean uh, Development Institute. We actually asked that question. If you sort of look at, the, look at the trajectories of incomes between zero and 19, how do they, how do they predict uh, future permanent income of the kids? And we found something pretty surprising. And that is the incomes in late childhood and, and adolescence have much more predictive power, they're more sensitive than the early, the ones when uh, children are young. So in other words, if I wanted to sort of say, if you, you know, mechanically, if there's a dollar higher here, could that have a bigger bang on my prediction than down here? It was almost monotonic. Now that's surprising because there's all this very compelling evidence, I believe, that about the efficacy of early childhood investment. But then this is the point I want to get to, and that is, I think where the research has to go is to not have this black box where parental incomes somehow produce some, some mysterious thing called education, 
that then the kid uh, take or the child takes to the labor market. If one thinks about the results, and uh, I think you know, again, this is speculation, but uh, I think this is what's going on. That whatever criticisms one has of the American welfare state, they're worse for adolescents <laughs> than, it's worse than it is for children. And furthermore, what income does is different. Adolescent incomes later, those have to do with schools and neighborhoods. It's a different thing that's being purchased. And so it's not a matter that, you know, that one wants to say early childhood or, or something else. It's rather, there's complicated complementarities, interactions between them. And in my judgment, we have to step back. An important thing to do is to step back from this scale or this blob of income produces a blob, or it's very scientific terms, I know, <laughs> of education, and that produces income. But rather to say the parents have this vector of th things that they do for a child. And I think that that, therefore, can, uh, will speak to that. It turns out that when you sort of take this perspective, you can generate a Gatsby curve based on the distribution of ages in a population. And the reason for that is, uh, as children get older, if I look at, if I look at 17 year olds, the, the, the variance of their parents' income is bigger than when they have one year olds. And so actually it generates a different type of Gatsby curve. And that is the cohort, the distribution of courts actually could create a relationship between inequality and persistence. So that's kind of the first thing I would say I think is an important measurement issue. The second is that I think that this literature, and you'll be to clear, many people are working on it needs even greater focus on issues of group inequality. This is an anecdote which you're not going to believe, but it's true. Uh, I was hyped on a debate team in high school and I was looking some book up and I was and I, looking for stuff on, on the guaranteed annual income was the topic. And I saw a paper that had the, something which I never forgot in it. It was, a, it was an occupational mobility table, not income, but occupation. And it was for, for African Americans and whites. And so it was, it was like 1962, so it was during, you know, ending of Jim Crow in which you could sort of say you had upper white collar, lower white collar, blue collar, I don't remember if it was upper or lower, and then uh, agriculture and manual. And if you looked at the white category, it's kind of what you would expect. <laughs> like, it becomes much more likely that you have a white collar child if the parent's white collar. For African Americans, it didn't matter what the parents were. They always were likely to have kids that were manual workers. So why do I bring this up? Because when we talk about mobility, we tend to, in some sense, think of it as the correlation of parents and kids. Well, that, that was a terrible lack of correlation. In other words, there was something about the nature of discrimination in America at that point in time, and I think the data in the late 50s was taken from, that many parents could not lock their kids in. And so I think that what we need is, and of course, I don't, this is not an original thought to say that the world has nonlinearities. I think we need way, ways to distinguish the, the characterization of inequalities and persistence intergenerationally between individuals and the morally salient and historically salient social groupings we face. And in saying that, that's kind of, you know, again, these, these come down to some of, you know, the devil's in the details. It's kind of, you know, figuring out the right ways to measure these things is hard. But I think that that's just another direction we have to go. I mean, to be, you know, very, maybe provocative or not, the reparations arguments, in my judgment, the strongest ones have to do with persistence. In other words, what, independent of one's views of contemporary discriminations, and I'm, again, I'm not taking a stance they are not existent. I'm saying even if you thought that, the persistence of what happened is so vast that the idea of, in, of affirmative, you know, you know, societal level efforts to break those, that persistence to me is a very, very morally powerful argument. And I think evidence on nonlinearities, on sort of, the term would be bottlenecks in which there's certain configurations of family, ethnicity, geography, they just make it really hard for kids to get above that. That type of focus should be explicit in the measurement of mobility. So I think that many of the inequalities we face in society are because of these the disparities in social interactions uh, that, that are faced. So from my perspective, uh, you know, I think that you, know, you ask issues about you know, what are the kind of standard things that people worry about, or what are the zoning restrictions, and how can relaxation promote socioeconomic integration. Now, relaxing zoning restrictions by itself, that's not, you know, that's, that's not, not self-evident that you actually have the construction going on. But that's kind of a thing you would want. That's kind of the first step. Obviously, government subsidies for middle-income housing, that's a thing that can be done. So at very micro levels, you can think about economic integration. 
if we're going to focus on race, I think there are extremely compelling arguments that uh, diversity both intrinsically matters and it matters intergenerationally. So for me, the preservation of the, the you know, the, the way in which we think about the construction of, of, of college classes and all that, that's all very important. And I think there'll be a, you know, it'd be a terrible uh, move backwards if the Supreme Court bans those types of policies. And so I, you know, I realize it's getting into politics and ethical issues, so, I, so I'm telling you what I, what I think is ethically appropriate. Those things have to be defended. I think another thing that I would probably emphasize in all this is that I think that is, the, uh, is the need for thinking about how to simply reduce the sources of disparities that are race-based in terms of everything from labor market connections to uh, uh, what I recall to the active imagination. And so those are just issues of information flows. If you said what's the policy consequence, I don't, I'm, that I'm not qualified to say. But I think that it's extraordinarily important that, uh, that there be actions that, you know, that, you know, when you go to the University of Chicago and you see in the spring the kids get off buses and walk around the campus, all that actually is meaningful. And so what I don't know, and this is where I, I could tell you who, to, who would, that's those types of things I would scale to dramatically break the psychological isolations that I think exist.